So tonight we're going to be talking about growing vegetable transplants. And so uh, up front, let me just say, I don't do endorse, endorsements, nor does the university. So if I mention a brand name, a supply source, or anything like that, don't construe it as being endorsement. It's just an example so we can have better communication. And certainly there may be other options, whether suppliers or products, that are equally as good in the same situation. The reason we consider using transplants in the garden is several fold. Um, and the single biggest one is speed to harvest. We get to harvest earlier. And it's nothing magical. It's just we start out with an older plant going into the ground. So certainly there are any number of our garden crops that we can self-sow and in some cases might be slightly better to self-sow even. Uh, but if we can use a transplant, what we're basically doing is starting that production season earlier. We're growing indoors, whether it's in a house or in a greenhouse, and we're getting a jump on the season. And so for our warm season crops, this certainly allows us to have a longer a harvest season because it starts earlier for us. For our cool season crops, particularly, uh, you know, when we have those hot maize that happen, if we can get out in the garden a little earlier and maybe the beginning of March instead of the end of March, then certainly we can see uh, success before hot weather arrives, even if it's a little early. And fall gardens, again, we're worried about when are those um, ending season frosts popping up, when are the freezes happening, and if we can get a harvest a couple of weeks earlier, that can sometimes be the difference between success and failure. So really a lot of it is earlier harvest and more success or more likelihood of harvest. We also like to use them because we are putting a larger, stronger plant into the garden. And so we do know that plants do have resistant systems and mechanisms within them for uh, both insect and disease pests. And certainly a larger, uh, more healthy plant, older plant, is stronger and better able to resist those pests. So while we don't uh, always escape every pest problem this way, it certainly gives us an option. It also reduces some of our gardening tasks, and I think really it's more of a trade-off, but we don't have to worry about thinning or doing replanting because we buried the seed too deeply or things like that. Certainly it trades off other tasks that we wouldn't have to do uh, if we're only direct sowing, but it does reduce some certain tasks. Another good one is assisting gardeners that might have limited physical uh, or mobility capabilities. So if you have, uh, instead of dealing with very small seeds, uh, sometimes transplants are easier. We do some school gardens here at the office. And so we actually use transplants almost exclusively for those school gardens just because it's a lot easier to get young kids to plant something correctly than it is to sow a seed correctly. So our success rate is much better when plants are planted. So we actually do transplants for, believe it or not, radishes and it actually works. I would never tell you to transplant radishes in your home garden. There, there's no great utility to it or no good reason, truthfully, unless you're dealing with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders uh, who aren't going to sow a radish seed correctly, then they're the perfect thing to use. So just because something isn't traditionally maybe a transplant doesn't mean we can't use it. And certainly tonight, given our timing, we are looking more at uh, talking about warm season transplants. So things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, all of those, now is the perfect time to start firing up uh, transplant production. And so we'll kind of talk about that more than cool season, which we'd actually be laid on. And a very big positive about growing transplants yourself is the variety that's available to you. So certainly, uh, you know, most of us are familiar with red tomatoes and yellow tomatoes, orange tomatoes. Some people know the stripy tomatoes. Well, there's also white ones and purple ones and pink ones and green ones, blue, and we've also got basically every size in between. So we have big beef steaks, we've got cherries, we've got grapes, we've got cocktail or salad tomatoes. And to find that purple cherry tomato, you're probably not gonna find that at a big box store necessarily. 
And so this is a great way to actually increase the variety that you grow in your garden is growing your own, simply because oftentimes uh, what's available to us to purchase are the big volume sellers. And so that's typically our standard colors, sizes, and varieties. If you want something different, oftentimes the only way you'll get a transplant is if you do it yourself. Yes. Um, when would you like, um, like transplant, like, um, could you do like, right now it's too cold to plant the seeds outside. Could you plant them inside and then transfer? Them? Exactly. And that's the concept of doing transplants. We start growing that plant when we can't in the ambient or native environment outside, and then we're able to get the jump on the season. So that's exactly correct. And so, you know, to me, I think that growing different varieties is part of the fun of gardening. When we don't do it, maybe we're missing out on something. The other thing about it is the timing of transplants. So like we would be perfect to leave here and tomorrow start our tomato transplants. That would give us about the right timing for an early May setting out of those plants. We could even wait a couple of weeks. But what if we knew we were going to be out of town in early May and we're like, well, we want to have transplants at the end of May, which is perfectly fine. There's no reason that we can't be transplanting tomatoes at the end of May. The problem is by the end of May, you're probably going to have a hard time finding transplants available locally because generally they start selling them too early <laughs> uh, for training for actually planting out in the garden. And so as we get past the, certainly the ideal time to transplant them out to the garden, they become scarce. They're almost not available. So that's another reason why I like growing my own transplants. I can time when they're ready for me. So it suits my schedule. So, you know, we talk about fall gardening. Uh, we can do kind of a second crop, a late crop of tomatoes by planting, you know, middle of July or so. Go try to find tomato transplants in the middle of July. You're not going to find them. And so that's why I encourage people to give this a shot because it gives you some more options. Do you transplant after the last frost? Um, you mean for like tomatoes? Yeah. Correct. So yeah. So what we're looking at on when we time our planting in the garden, we look at when our last frost of spring is. So typically by May 1st, ordinarily most years it will have happened. But it's also more complicated than just a frost state. So it's also not just the air temperature, but even the soil temperature. So we can have cool springs where, you know, I would certainly wait until May 15th to plant a tomato. Not because I'm worried about frost, but just because our soils might not have warmed up much. If we've had a cool, wet spring, we can have soils that are still cooler than that tomato once, which means if I plant it out there, I'm not really doing anything that great for it because it's sitting there. It's not going to be growing happily. Uh, by the same token, we can have a hot, warm spring. And so, you know, if, if we did, and it may be reasonable to have them out at the very end of April. That's going to be rare, I think, for us. Um, but, you know, in theory, it could happen. So, yeah, that's, you know, and, and that's part of it, too. When we're growing our own transplants, we want a decent-sized transplant. Honestly, the problem I see more often than anything, people grow too large of a transplant. It overgrows the container they're growing it in. And then you get a plant that's root-bound. And there's actually research that shows with commercial production, when you have root bound plants, uh, they're stunted and really they never recover out in the field fully. Uh, the yield potential of them is depressed and it never recovers fully. Um, and so certainly, I mean, I don't think yield is as sensitive as commercial operations where it's, you know, return on investment and everything like that. But certainly gardeners want the best outcome possible too. And so having, I'd rather have a small young transplant than something much larger and overgrown always. Young things grow and establish quicker than larger plants and older plants. And so there is a trade-off when we buy that $8 tomato plant that's, you know, a month or two older than what we'd be producing ourselves. Yes, it will fruit earlier, but is the full production there for the plant? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, and so that's why small young transplants, you know, used to uh, a standard for the industry was six plants to a cell pack. Very common, great for the garden, size works good. It's very hard to find those now. Most everything is in a larger container. 
with a larger and price. More money. Yeah. yeah. And, and certainly if you want one or two tomato plants, okay, four or five, six dollars for a transplant. Okay. But if you're wanting to do 20, you can buy an awful lot of tomatoes for a hundred dollars at the farmer's market yeah. without the labor. Uh, and, and so to me, that's another reason I like it is there is sometimes a cost savings associated with it. And certainly there's some cost to it as well. Uh, and that's one of the negatives. So it's not that transplants is only a positive proposition. Certainly we're limited on the time we have available to do things. We're limited on how much money we wanna to spend to do things. And we may not have the space to do it because uh, it does take space to grow these plants. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of things we don't have to grow transplants for. Uh, even tomatoes, I know it'd be a hard sell to most gardeners to tell them don't transplant tomatoes, but when we look at processing tomatoes, they're not uh, transplanted. Most of those are direct sown into fields, and it's because of the value of what they're producing is so much less. The cost of the transplant doesn't make sense financially, and so, you know, even things we might default think of as, oh, that's a transplant crop. We might even have situations where we can direct sow. How many people have ever had a tomato um, self-sow in the garden and then it grows up next year and you have tomatoes off of it and it's great. I had one gardener a month or two ago that said, you know, I said, the best tomatoes I had were the ones that self-sowed that I, that I completely ignored. The volunteers in the garden, they were the best ones in the entire garden. I think I'm going to give up garden and just start volunteering. <laughs> It might work, uh, but you know, and, and so you know, certainly we can see success with sometimes direct sown. So it's not not something that we have. It, we don't want to present the concept that direct sowing is bad in the garden. It's not. It's good. It's effective, and oftentimes it's a labor savings activity to do it. Um, we do know that some plants uh, can experience transplant shock. Again, smaller plants transplant more successfully, but cucurbits. There's a lot of back and forth, a lot of thought on whether our cucumbers, cantaloupe squashes, if they actually benefit from being transplanted or not, uh, because they aren't the, when we do transplant those, we want to be careful to have minimal root disturbance with them. So certainly direct sowing works great for them. Uh, and so there's, I've even talked to commercial growers who do both. They'll actually have some that they transplant out and some that they direct sow. And they'll tell me, they really don't see a big benefit to transplanting. Some of them try to do it, try to get a little bit quicker to harvest, uh, but overall it's not this huge boon to the plant necessarily. So don't think that transplants are always by default a better option. Yes. So if you went in the case of tomatoes, if you direct seed, when would you put them in the ground? I would probably direct seed probably about, uh, no earlier than May 1st. And if it's been a chilly spring, I'd probably wait till the 10th, oh. maybe 15th even. Because again, when we're direct sowing, we're much more concerned about our soil temperature. For something like pepper and eggplant, I'd probably even delay that to minimum the 15th of May or later. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, so we do want to pay close attention to what our soil temperatures are doing, what the weather has done. Uh, we can actually look online and find soil temperatures for areas. So if you don't have a soil thermometer, it's not a problem. There are uh, options available to you. And so here's just pulled out from one of UT's publications and just kind of shows that for a lot of our plants, we do predominantly use transplants, uh, not just our warm season stuff, which is kind of our folks not, but things like broccoli, cabbage, things like that certainly are spring growers we often use transplants in those. And a lot of it has to do with, it gets us to harvest faster. And so like for most things like broccoli and cabbage, we'd be starting those about six to eight weeks before we want to put them out. We would put them out about this time of year. Middle of March is not a bad time to be transplanting those out. It could be a little later, but most years middle of March works well. So that means we'd want to start our seeds or our transplants about the 1st of February to get about that six week period. Um, and certainly, you know, we, we can control somewhat how quickly plants grow when we're growing them indoors, by adjusting temperature, for instance. So if things are getting too large, we can kind of cool things down. If they're getting too large, we can warm things up. They do that a lot in greenhouses, uh, playing with nighttime temperatures. 
especially because it's easier to adjust. Uh, but certainly six to eight weeks for most of our transplants is adequate. Some can be a little bit shorter, but you can see there, even on this list, there are a large number of those crops that are marked as both direct sowing or seeding and transplanting. So it's not always an either or proposition. So what are some basics about growing transplants? So I'm assuming most of the time, most people are gonna be growing these indoors in their house somewhere, and that's great. Uh, ambient household conditions where you're staying anywhere, you know, between 50 and 75 are gonna work for most things, certainly on the higher end of that for a more warm season things. But most people run their houses, what, 68, 72, almost year round for the most part, that works well. Uh, and certainly a little bit warmer from soft for some of our more tropical things isn't a bad thing. What is good is that we have a little bit of a temperature differential at night. So uh, it's not uncommon that houses cool down a little bit at night, especially on a sunny day like today. If you've got a lot of windows, part of your house probably warmed up some today. If it drops off at night, that's not a bad thing because that's natural outside what happens when we get up in the morning, it's chilly, but then by the time we get to late afternoon, we're almost to 65 or 70 some days. So that's all right. We do want to have um, good airflow around these plants. We don't want stagnant air more or less. Um, so you know, it's not something where I'd say, hey, let's stick them in the basement. Uh, if it's not a well-ventilated area, you can add fans. There's good reasons to use fans. It can help us produce stocky plants. Um, but certainly good airflow is necessary. We do need to keep in mind that we're dealing with potting soils or media and we're dealing with watering, so it can get a little messy. So where we do this in the house, we need to consider that because uh, we don't want heartache uh, after we get started. Yes, so I'll, we'll talk about that later. So good question. Here, 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 and here we are later. <laughs> Next slide. So potting media, and you'll notice it doesn't say potting soil. Potting media or potting soil actually doesn't have any soil in it. That's a good thing. When we take soil out of the ground, even good soils, they don't perform well in a container. We're changing things up. We're making it a little bit different. So we don't want to use soil out of the garden. We don't want to use bag top soil. We don't want to use garden soil. We don't want to use raised bed soil. What we want to use is potting media. Uh, and so what this primarily, this is what you always put in your flower pots. Uh, so this is not unusual. You may have never realized it's not soil, but it's not. Uh, generally, it's primarily composed of things like peat moss, perlite, composted barks. Um, you can have vermiculite in some, um, although there's perlite and vermiculite have both been limited uh, in supply the past few years. Uh, so they're not as readily available. We're seeing now more additions of things like uh, rice hulls. If you've ever seen those in uh, media, you can also sometimes find uh, coconut fibers or core, uh, C-O-I-R, those are in there as well. And there can be other components, but most of the mass marketed ones are peat moss based with bark and then perlite. Those are great. Uh, they could include a fertilizer. We don't have to have a fertilizer early on. So it's not that we must find one with a fertilizer. The truth is if you're looking for a potting media without fertilizer, you're gonna have a hard time finding one. So it's not a problem that it's in there but we don't need a huge amount of fertilization with this. These plants are small, their demands for nutrition is small, and uh, it's not a problem if it doesn't have it because we can fertilize lightly. If it has any in it at all, most of them will have some sort of starter charge or fertilizer uh, input to it. That's probably gonna do us well the entire time we're growing our transplants because they don't have a huge demand. My general little rule of thumb when it comes to potting media, generally avoid the cheapest thing they're selling and the most expensive thing they're selling. The cheapest is probably a lower quality and the most expensive is probably some sort of gimmick. Uh, and that, in my experience, that has borne out to be fairly true. I, I, middle of the pack, I've used store brands. Some of them are fine. I've used name brands. They're fine. There's 
it, it doesn't have to be where we purchase the most expensive thing they have because that doesn't guarantee a success. Sometimes people will ask, must I use a seed starting mix? So the big difference between just your basic potting media that we would put in our pots for plants and a seed starting mix, mix is the fineness of the material in it. Seed starting mixes are finer, smaller particles. It is better, especially for very small plants, but you can certainly grow successfully with just a basic potting media and you just make sure the largest chunks aren't on the surface. You can actually sift or use a sieve to uh, pull out larger pieces. Uh, the other day I had a, a store brand bag of uh, potting media. I was filling some things up and it had some big chunks of wood, as big as my thumb. So, you know, that's not something we would always find, especially maybe some of the better name, name brand products, but you just kind of pull the big chunks out of the way and go on. It's not a, a true harmful issue with the potting mix. Uh, you're going to see it's there. You're going to know it's there. So there's nothing wrong with purchasing a seed starting mix, but I haven't purchased any in years and my seeds grow. So there's nothing magical about it. Smaller particles for very small seeds, there's a slight benefit. Uh, but honestly, common sense, if you see a big chunk of bark or wood on the surface, pull it off and then you're probably still good to go. Uh, and again, uh, it, it isn't uh, something that's a must. We do want to pre-moisten the media. Now, what do I mean by that? Peat moss-based medias, which most are, we're getting some options in the market that aren't, but by and large, they're still peat-based. When peat moss is dry, it becomes hydrophobic, which means it actually repels water. This is why we would never advise you to use peat moss as a uh, surface mulch. It's because it is hydrophobic. So if it dries out and you get a rain and it's on the surface, your peat moss washes away because it won't actually absorb into the peat moss. It won't go through it, just kind of runs off the surface and carries peat moss with it. So because of that, if you've ever opened up a dry bag, you can literally throw it on top of a bucket of water and it will float on the water. It will. It will. So what I encourage folks to do is it's not a permanent condition. They actually put uh, surfactants or wetting agents in the potting media mixes, even the organic ones. Some of the organic ones uh, are actually plant based. They use uh, yucca extracts. So uh, from the roots, oddly Can enough. You just miss the so compound? oftentimes misting is a good way to start. If you're doing a large volume, you can just pour a bunch of water in and walk away. So sometimes misting does, I think, tend to help because you're using smaller particles of water. Um, but most of the time, if I know I'm going to be doing a lot of potting, I'll try to moisten it the day before. So even if it's floating on top of water, give it, you know, eight or 10 hours, it's probably going to absorb it well. Because again, there are those surfactants in there that help us out. And so most greenhouses, if you talk to greenhouses that do a lot of potting, uh, especially if they're still doing it by hand, a lot of them will, they'll fill up their tables that they use to fill flats with, and they'll actually wet it down kind of the last thing of the day. So when they come in the next day, it's good to go. And so do be aware that if you think I'm on a plant today and it's completely dry, you may have a hard time getting that soil to take up the moisture. And again, it's not soil, it's media in truth. Um, so, you know, certainly if we're looking at the cost of medias, sometimes it can be better to source maybe from a farm store, just because sometimes they can be sourcing like compressed bells. Those used to be something you could find at uh, places like Lowe's and Home Depot. Don't know. It's it's getting harder to find those larger compressed bells. Now they're heavy, but because they're compressed, it's a lot in a small volume. And generally, on a price per quart or liter, it was a fairly attractive price. And so, uh, certainly, some of our uh, farm supply stores might be able to still source that for you. May not have it in stock, so this might be something you check a month in advance. Uh, but certainly, they might have a good option there. So containers, uh, 
basically there's a few rules with containers, but we have a lot of leeway. So the biggest thing, any sort of container we're using, we have to have drain holes in the bottom of it. Most purpose-made seed starting containers already have that inherently built in. If we're re if we're doing something else, so if we're taking you know uh, six to eight ounce drink cups and using those, they work great. Um, just poke a hole in the bottom, uh, and, and anything like that. There's any sort of different things we can repurpose, we can reuse, um, and just make sure they have that hole in the bottom for drainage. We like to be able to pull the transplant out of there easily. If you look at things like purpose-made containers, typically they're smooth sides. There's not typically a lot of ribs or undulations to them. And so you can easily kind of squeeze and pull at the same time and most stuff pops out easily. Think about that if you're reusing containers. Obviously things purposely built work great, but other things do too. So don't think we must go out and purchase these little seed, start carding, <clears throat> seed starting kits uh, that are probably woefully overpriced for what they are when we can use something as simple as a drink cup with a hole put yeah, stuck oh, in the I bottom. To save money. Absolutely. And, th and that's it. So, you know, and again, just be aware that whatever we're using, the smaller the volume it is, the less water it's going to hold in that media. So really small containers or really small options on size are going to dry out frequently, which means we're going to have to water them more frequently. So think about that. And again, I like six or eight ounce cups. They do, they aren't necessarily as economical on space as some of the purpose-built options. But if you're not super tight on space or just wanting to do a few things, worst case scenario, you buy a thing of cups and you drink out the ones that you don't plan in. So there's really not a lot of waste. You can even recycle ones you have used, wash them out, use them. So you keep them moist all the time. No, we allow them to dry out somewhat. We'll get to that in a moment. Good question. So here are some sort of outside the box examples. Some of these would work well uh, and maybe some not. Uh, things like the egg carton. It looks really great. We're being green and regenerative, but that's a very small volume when you get right down to it. So that would only be suitable for a very small transplant. The same thing with using a toilet paper roll, same ideal. That's a very small plant that's going to be happy in there. Because again, we don't want them to be completely root bound, but uh, we'll, and we're limiting that volume. Certainly um, newspaper sort of self-made pots is a possibility. There are little tools you can buy to do that, or you can just use a bottle or something as a form and do it. So you don't actually have to purchase the little tool. Looks nifty, the but- The advantage of those is you just pick up the newspaper yep. and put it into the ground. You can. You don't have to pry it out of a container. Exactly. And so the advantage of some of these biodegradable options is exactly what was just said. They do biodegrade. So we don't necessarily have to pop the transplant out. There are some big caveats with that. We have to make sure that none of the container stands above the ground. If it does, it acts as a wick and it really pulls moisture out of that transplant area. So if we're using peat pots, for instance, or something like that, make sure you completely bury that pot or you tear off anything you're not burying. We don't want any of those organic base, those uh, biodegradable materials to be sticking out of the ground because they do wick moisture out. And so they will cause that plant to dry out faster than it would if it wasn't sticking out of the ground. So nothing wrong with any of those. And certainly for something we're worried about, we don't want to disturb the roots. Some of these biodegradable options are good. The peat pellets up in the right-hand corner, same caveat, you got a very small volume of soil. It works great for transplanting radishes, lettuces, little things like that, uh, because you're not growing a huge plant. And so that's not to, again, to besmirch their name or say they're not useful, but I wouldn't be growing a tomato transplant, those most likely. However, something small, it works great. Yes. Um, something I've seen on YouTube, I didn't know if it would work well or not, but those like um, tall barbecue dishes, you can get a um, 
Dollar Tree, the little aluminum ones, mm -hmm. and then you poke small holes in the bottom and put like a plastic wrap over it. That way it's kind of like a greenhouse. Yep. So yeah, there's any number of food containers that work well. So it, there's any number of people that will say, uh, you know, take out containers and cups or purchase aluminum dishes. It basically at the end of the day, you need a, something, a container that holds soil and has holes for drainage. There's a lot of things that will meet that definition, including what you just said. So just be aware there is a lot of opportunity and license to come up with something interesting. There's even soil blocking where there is no container. They actually just uh, will use a media that will clump together well. And there's these little forms they put it in. I've never personally done soil blocking, uh, but there's any number of farms uh, that I'm aware of that do it. Um, so it certainly works. Uh, but at the end of the day, all we need is for that media to hold together. And so there are blends of soils that will work for soil blocking and other medias that certainly would not. So kind of, you know, we talked about those kits you can buy. Do we have to have those plastic dome thingies? Well, no. So they can be useful. And what they are doing, it is creating a little bit of a greenhouse effect. So it is maybe creating a little bit higher temperature for us. It's certainly holding in moisture more, raising humidity. The problem is it's also reducing light. So any glass, any plastic reduces light to some degree. Uh, and basically what's the trade-off? If the benefits of what we're getting by using it is offset of the lack of sunlight or reduced light, then we're okay. The truth is most of our seedlings that we're growing as vegetables, they're not that picky. So we can use it in, to begin with. So after we've sown uh, our seeds, we can cover it. But what I like to do, as soon as they're germinating, I pull it off because I want maximum light to reach those young plants. Heat mats, kind of the same thing. Certainly some of our warm, more warm season crops are going to be benefited if we can keep that soil media uh, at, you know, 75 degrees. And so that's a little bit higher than maybe ambient in our houses. So the seedling heat mats can work well to do that. But as soon as they start germinating, I jerk the mat out. Because if you don't, you're going to really start driving growth. You're going to accelerate it. And while that sounds like a good thing, I want a small, slow-growing seedling rather than something getting big, tall, and lanky. And so I'm not trying to push growth with heat. I just want to create the most optimum germination situation. For a lot of things, they're going to germinate perfectly well without a heat mat. Um, I've got some heat mats. Occasionally, I'll use them for some things. Lots of times, I won't. The only difference I see is sometimes things germinate faster because they're on the heat mat. It's not a bad thing. If you've got them, use them. But just understand, don't keep them under there for days and days and days because you're going to end up with a, a gangly plant that's not the best quality. So again, nice to have. They're a tool if you have them, but not a necessity. And so this is just kind of showing uh, some of our germination temperatures, growing temperatures, and then conditions for hardening. And so this is actually from a resource from Penn State. Hardening off transplants is basically just getting them ready to go out to the tough environment outside. Why is outside tough? You've got higher levels of light. So, you know, plants, we can actually sunburn them. If we take plants, throw them out in full sun, all of a sudden, basically they can sunburn. Um, humidity outside, generally it's not as controlled and even as it is indoors. Temperature, certainly not. We have wider ranging temperature range outdoors. So by exposing plants to all those environmental factors slowly, starting out just a few hours at a time outside and not sticking them out immediately in, in the direct sun, we, we allow them to acclimate outdoors. So it's called hardening off. Basically, we're taking them from that hopefully perfect growing environment we created indoors, sticking them out into the harsh realities of the world. And so by doing that gradually over a week or two, oftentimes you'll hear a hardening also mentioned 
reducing watering or increasing the free, the time in between waterings. We don't let them wilt. We don't want our plants to wilt, but certainly starting to stretch out that interval a little bit is also a way we can help harden our plants. And so again, if you want to follow up, there's the resource there and it'll be listed. So do we need supplemental life? I think the biggest limiting challenge to good seedling growth is light. What happens when we don't have good light is called etiolation, E-T-I-O-L, A-T-I-O-N. And what it results in is what we see there in that picture. You see long internode growth. So the plants are stretching. So the leaves are further apart from one another. In severe cases, you get that yellowing like you see there. Those aren't green. That's not your screen being a little off on the color or a bad picture. They're not green because they're not getting the sunlight they need. Almost universally, you're going to have a better transplant by using supplemental light. Um, there's very rare occasions where that would not be the case. And, all, and the reason is if you look at what outdoor light, the amount of it that's there versus what indoor lights have, it's dramatically different. And how quickly light falls off from even a bright window, it's dramatic how quickly you go from decent amounts to none at all, almost. It, it's, it's really remarkable if you actually look at it. You can find some videos online if you wanna think about that more. What's good, it's not too particular what lights we use. And so, you know, certainly for decades, fluorescent, you know, shop lights basically were the standard. We now have LEDs and the biggest advantage LEDs offer us is efficiency. They use less power. And so certainly either one can still be used successfully. The big thing is when we're talking about using supplemental light, we do want the lights to be two to four inches above the plant. We want them close because if that light is a foot above versus very close, they're getting less light when it's a foot above. There's actually loss. So the closer to the light, the better. Now there's caveats with that. And this is just a slide that's looking at kind of the different types of fluorescents that are out there. Again, I think a lot of these have been displaced by uh, LEDs, particularly since pricing is coming down on LEDs. But essentially at the end of the day, with like the different types of fluorescents or even LEDs, if I have a fluorescent light bank that I have or, or shop lights that I'm using, if I've already made that purchase and they're doing fine, I'm gonna keep using them. I'm not gonna run out and buy LEDs because unless my electric bill is too much to deal with, at the end of the day, to a certain extent, light is still light. Now we know uh, there are different spectrums of light. You have warm and cool uh, lights. Uh, when you look at growing lamps or growing lights for plants, you can find full spectrum or wide spectrum. Um, some of those are beneficial, but for vegetable transplants, and this was directly from University of Missouri, and so they're actually talking about just using cool white tubes, 40 watts from fluorescent lighting, nothing special, nothing you'd have to track down at a, a gardening store, anything like that. They're the least expensive and they produce a mostly blue light. So they're not well balanced, but they can create healthy, stocky salad greens and vegetable transplants. The reason is the amount of time that we are growing these plants for is relatively small. We don't want a nine week old tomato transplant. So the sooner I can get it out to the outdoors, the better truthfully. And so I'm not worried about the fact that these lights aren't perfectly balanced. In the second paragraph there, basically they say, you know, these grow lights that are balanced, that have a broader spectrum to it. That's what you need when you're more worried about indoor flowering and fruiting, things like that. So basically, we're just trying to create a vegetative plant, a leafy plant. We can do that easily with lights. It doesn't take anything expensive. It doesn't take anything really sophisticated. Shop lights, fluorescent lights have done it for decades successfully. So don't think we have to run out and buy LEDs. If you want to, awesome. I will say this, there are some caveats with that. I have seen 
on YouTube where people have actually tested like the reported spectrums and uh, output from different like grow lamps and things they buy on Amazon or elsewhere. It's not always truth in advertising. So um, make sure you're buying from reputable dealers that will stand behind their product. Uh, and certainly, you know, if you want LEDs, awesome. I don't personally believe it's a requirement to produce quality plants. Uh, in my office, I inherited when I started this job, a uh, fluorescent light setup, and it works fine. There, there, there's the one thing I don't like about it is it actually produces more heat than I have ever seen fluorescent lights produce. I don't love that, uh, but I so I have to be careful on how close I put it. But other than that, I really, uh, from the quality of light standpoint, fluorescent works. We do want to watch heat on these. And this is a real world example for me. That's actually a snapshot out of my office. If you notice the little thing hanging down from the black light there, that is actually a connector that goes on the end of the bulb. I disconnected it because I was trying to get the heat down. So I actually have one bulb that's not actually lit in there. So instead of a six light, I have, I have five tubes lit in there because I'm trying to reduce the heat load there. Uh, the other thing is I have them on a timer. And so I don't put them on a timer for like five hours at a time. I have them off and on fairly frequently. So they can cool off. And exactly. So it doesn't build up a heat load under there. So, you know, again, not every fluorescent light does that. That's kind of unusual, the amount of heat they put out. Uh, and I actually will sometimes use a fan when I do have a lot of light going, so I don't get too much heat build up underneath there. I also like fans, dries things out. When the plants are moving, it helps them to stay stocky. So uh, there's good reasons to use it even outside of heat. Uh, the good thing is this is just kind of a wire shelving unit. Uh, these lights are purposely built grow lights so they actually have hangers kind of built into them so they have like cables running from the top and a hook so you can just hook it and move it on the rack above to raise or lower the light as the plants grow do raise it i have had plants that i didn't raise it quick enough and i've burned their leaves uh so you know just be aware that that adjustability to raise and lower lights is important because you do want to have this going up, raising as those plants are getting larger. We'd still like to keep, you know, two to three inches above the plant. So we're getting the maximum uh, received light by those plants. So that means we need to be able to move. You dry the soil out, don't you have to monitor? I do. And so that's the other thing with the heat. So, you know, if you ask me, if you said, I have no setup whatsoever, should I look at LEDs? I would say, yeah, I think LEDs are a good option. They run cooler than fluorescents. But again, these fluorescents, I'm not sure why, but they put out more heat than fluorescent lights normally do. Um, and now granted, the, these are kind of high output lights. You know, there's six fluorescent tubes in there. A lot of our overhead lighting indoors is two, maybe four. I've got six, and so I mean, there, there is more there to create heat. Uh, but again, I, I think some of it just is the nature of these particular lights. Um, but I'm not running out to replace these. I'm trying to mitigate that problem and deal with it. And honestly, it's not been a problem. It's just been something I've had to deal with. Well, you got it going on. <laughs> so too much of a good thing in reference to fertility. We don't need much fertility for these plants. Again, we're just doing vegetative growth. I'm happy if they're growing slowly and progressing. I'm not trying to drive growth quickly at this stage. So again, it's hard to find medias that don't have that fertilizer included. So, you know, most of the time you don't even have to worry about it. If you had one that didn't, uh, this is where you could use a water soluble fertilizer, miracle Grow or any of the other gazillion brands out there. Uh, you could use houseplant food if you wanted to. You know, you don't have to rush out necessarily and buy a fertilizer that's specifically for vegetables. Uh, they're close enough, no more than what these need. Uh, if you look at a lot of the different labeled products for more specific categories of plants, the ratios of the nutrients might be a little different, but they're fairly similar. They're still plants and they still have the same basic needs. But if you are going to fertilizer, don't do too much. I would do half the label rate. How long do those fertilizers last? Like, you know, right. you know if you buy a big container. So the, well, I mean, I believe the miracle Grow label is for application every two weeks as a water-soluble fertilizer. 
and 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 that's kind of assuming that you don't already have fer fertility in that potting media. So like if you're growing flowers in a flower pot, there's a lot of flowers based on how long we have them there. We don't need to do any fertilizing to that pot. No, I mean yeah. the containers say. Oh, well, it just depends how much you use. Well, I had some that I've had for more than a year because it all just depends how much I use. So if there's just a few things I'm fertilizing. It's going to last me a long time if I'm fertilizing a lot. And, and truthfully, the water-soluble fertilizers are not the most cost-efficient fertilizer we can use in the garden. There are cheaper fertilizers that if we put them down at planting, we might supplement with some liquid feeding later. Uh, liquid feeds work great for container type situations where it's not necessarily easy to have a lot of fertility waiting there, but we know there's slow release fertilizers like Osmocote and other brands that are great. Uh, so we can put those in when we plant, they slowly release over time. So oftentimes that might be one time of the year we do that the season. Uh, if, we're, if we're doing multiple crops in a pot or in a garden, we might come back when we start the next crop and replace uh, fertility. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we don't have to use a lot of fertilizer, the liquid feed fertilizer, because honestly it's more expensive, the, the formulation is. So if you said, you know, I'm going to fertilize my vegetable garden, we're going to look at more granular type fertilizers that are broadcast or worked into the ground instead of liquid fertilizers. One, because most of the time we can do one fertility for certainly phosphorus and potassium for the season. And then nitrogen, we come back with side dressing uh, for those that need it. So, but yeah, I mean, I would never tell anyone you should fertilize your entire garden with miracle Grow for the entire season. That'd be cost prohibitive. But miracle Grow works great when you need that shot of fertilizer somewhere. So it's, again, water-soluble fertilizers are not bad but I wouldn't apply them on a large scale because it becomes cost prohibitive in my opinion. So what about sowing the seed? So one of the things we want to do is make sure that we are completely filling our media containers. Uh, generally to start with, I overfill. And then lots of times I will actually water because what will happen, you get subsidence, you get air pockets, basically collapsing and suddenly you had an inch over the top and now it's an inch too low and you got to add more. So, you know, you can kind of pack it in, but I'm always afraid, am I compressing it too much? So I just let water remove the air for me and it does a good job. Then lots of times what I'll do after I watered in that media and I've got the volume in there I want, I will put the seed on top of the media and then come back and lightly cover it with more potting mix. Most seed do not have to be very deeply at all. Uh, in fact, a common failure is we plant things too deeply. The smaller the seed, the less deep it needs to be. A lot of our seeds should never be any deeper than a quarter of an inch. That's not deep at all, really. And so putting them on the surface and lightly covering them works great. We can compress them down a little bit. Uh, the other reason I like to do the watering in this sequence before the seed is present if we have very small seeds and we water, they can actually float out of the media and when water runs off, they're gone. So I like to not water away my seeds. So by watering the media, spritzing works well. Uh, I've got a picture in a minute of a spray bottle for that very reason. So lots of times with small things, I like using a, a just a spray bottle. Again, nothing, it's the same spray bottle we would use for anything, nothing special about it. It's a low amount of volume being placed on that media. And because of that, it works well for it. There's kind of a rule of thumb that says plant the seeds twice as wide as their width in the media. It starts getting a little complicated where I'm like, okay, well, which is the length and which is the length, uh, width or length on the seed? Um, but basically, don't bury things too deep. If there's one thing that happens, people go too deep with them. A good thing to do if you're unsure, look at a seed packet. Seed packets typically will tell you the planting depth. Rule of thumb, the bigger the seed, the deeper it can go. The smaller the seed, closer to the surface. We certainly can sow more than one seed per seed. 
sell or per container, but make sure you go back and thin those. Having too many plants in the same cell or container just re results in a couple of smaller plants instead of one nice plant. So by and large, um, if you're better off to thin it to the strongest plant, that's not always the first one that germinates. Sometimes you will see where a plant just a little bit off. Uh, the cotyledons didn't survive coming out of the seed well, or it, for whatever reason, it is growing real gangly, really long and stretched. You may be better off to keep a later seed that germinated rather than the first one. So th there's nothing wrong with having them there for a few days to evaluate which one you want to keep. The other thing you can do is you can oftentimes pull those apart and replant one. So a lot of propagation, they won't necessarily sow directly into every cell. They will sow into larger trays. They'll have a number of seeds in there. And then they'll, when they're very small, pull those seeds out and replant them into a larger container. It's a little more work. Depends how expensive your seed is, how much space you have for germinating and growing young seedlings, uh, but certainly you can do that. You don't have to only sow them into the final container. Do keep in mind there are some seeds that need light. So these are particularly ones that we want to be cautious about how deeply we're sowing those. So things like lettuce, dill, snapdragons, and petunias, be extra cautious. And the other tip I would give you is label, label, label. You will not remember what is what. The tray will get turned around and what you swore was lettuce ends up being something else. And that works if everything looks different. When, when you're trying to figure out, okay, which of these is broccoli, which one is cabbage, and which one is kohlrabi, and probably not going to know. That may mean your garden bed is a mix of different things, which may, may look great. Surprise. Yeah, Surprise. Uh, surprises are sometimes good, but certainly labeling is good. Dates are good, just so you have an ideal, because for me, it's like, well, how many days ago did I plant this? Should I be seeing now? Do I need to uh, go back and reseed? Or is it still within that window based on the temperatures I'm seeing for germination? Not everything is going to germinate super quick. So don't necessarily count things down and out. Uh, but certainly knowing that date is a good bit of information. So you can remember, has it been three days or five days? Or has it been nine days? What's going on? So I do think labeling is something we uh, should do well. I'm not saying I do it well personally but certainly it is good. This is one reason why I do like sometimes using styrofoam cups. Styrofoam cups, when you ride on them, of course it incises into the styrofoam. So it's really easy to keep track of because it's on the individual cup. I don't have a tag stuck somewhere that gets knocked off. Uh, so there are some benefits maybe from using a less than environmentally perfect product. Watering. We do want to allow the surface of the media to dry out. And as these plants get larger, I'm letting them dry out a little more. So oftentimes when I'm early with these seedlings, I am using a spray bottle. Because when we think about how much of a root system do they have, I don't necessarily need to wet four inches deep in that container the first few days. I can be okay if I'm doing a more shallow watering. I don't want to do that the entire time they're there because I want to encourage those roots to grow deeper. But certainly sometimes when we have a very small seedling and a relatively large volume of soil, too much water can waterlog it. We can get too wet of conditions. So I do like for very young seedlings using a spray bottle, using a sprinkling bottle. Um, if you've ever seen the laundry sprinklers, they used to go in the old glass pop bottles, for instance. Those work well. If you're not nostalgic, you can just poke holes in a water bottle lid and, and use that. Uh, but uh, certainly any way to apply low amounts of water early, because you've got a little bitty plant, doesn't need a huge amount of water. We can water from below. And certainly a lot of these seed growing tray system thingies water from below. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, but we don't necessarily want water standing in the bottom of the tray. We can break the rule a little bit. So like when I leave here on Fridays and I've got seedlings, most of the time I leave a little water standing in the bottom of that tray because I know I'm not going to see them again until Monday. If we have a holiday, I might not see them again until Tuesday. And so I do provide a little bit extra reservoir of water in there. It's a trade-off. I'm not here. 
and I don't want to get them too dry, ideally I might not leave that water standing if I had my choice. But again, it's a trade-off. What happens if we leave them standing in water, the very bottoms of media, that media that stays saturated isn't going to grow a lot of roots. Roots have to have oxygen. And so if we're keeping that flooded, we don't have growth. And if the root's already there, we're risking killing them. And that sets up all kinds of problems. So I don't love having standing water. There's some occasion for trade-offs on that. We can have a lot of diseases. Most of the diseases are directly linked to overwatering. And so things like damping off, where you kind of get uh, in the left-hand picture a narrowing of that stem. If you compare those two stems, uh, they receded at the same time but you get that kind of shoestringing of the stem. Sometimes it will just dry up and there won't be much there at all. Um, that plant's never going to be a good plant for us. And so the way we can combat uh, all these different diseases really is to keep them drier. One of the ways we encourage drier conditions is utilizing a fan that moves that humid air as it, it uh, evaporates from the plant or from the potting media it moves it out of there. So we don't keep real humid conditions immediately around those plants. So again, a fan is not a bad thing to have if you're growing seedlings. That's what I'm saying here. So if you got hot running lights like I do, or helps remove excess moisture from that immediate environment, and then you have the physiological stress, the movement from the wind that actually helps keep those plants smaller and stockier, which is what we want. Um, we can, I don't think it would happen much in the home necessarily. In um, greenhouses, they have horizontal airflow fans because they want to keep fresh air around those plants because those plants can actually exhaust the carbon dioxide in the areas immediately close to their leaves. And so they want to keep those canopies having fresh air influx to them. So they actually have horizontal airflow. that so all they do, those fans are moving that air around to mix it in the greenhouse. They will also do physical control on plant height on booms. So if they have spray booms that are doing watering or anything like that, they will actually have curtains that hang down on those booms that actually brush the top of the plants. And that physical sensation, that physical touch, that movement will actually help keep them smaller and stocky. So physically brushing your plants, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, with LEDs, they don't produce much um, heat, but would they still benefit from a fan like the... Yep. So, and that's it. So I wouldn't relegate a fan to only heat control. Uh, there are good reasons for the moisture and also that uh, physical movement to put the fan, even if you have LEDs that are running cooler or you don't have a problem with heat buildup in your lights. Um, th there are good reasons to do a fan. It's not something we have to run 24-7 either. Uh, so it's, it's not necessarily going to be something that's going to be taxing to the electric bill, uh, but certainly having the option to use it is a good thing. I mentioned this earlier, don't want to reiterate too much, but basically get those plants used to the environment we're going to be putting them in. That's what we do when we harden off plants. Uh, be careful, don't stick them out in direct sun. Be aware of patios and things like that can oftentimes uh, absorb a lot of heat so they can get hot quickly on sunny days like we've had today. And while we can, again, kind of stretch uh, the frequency of watering to where we're watering less frequency we don't want these plants wilting wilting is not good for plants basically the standard rule of thumb for any plant whether we're talking about transplants of vegetables or woody materials we're buying we want to plant them at the same depth they were growing as a transplant that gets tricky on woody things because sometimes they're buried uh, either in the ball and burlap or a container that's a different story for another day. But the one exception to the vegetable world are tomatoes. So tomatoes can be planted deeper than they were growing. If you've ever seen tomato stems, if you've seen those little like bumpy things on them, oftentimes they're white, looks really weird. I sometimes get pictures sent to me, people saying, what's wrong with my tomatoes? Those are aerial roots that are forming. So tomatoes very readily form aerial roots, uh, adventitious roots, a more correct term along that stem. 
And so we can take advantage of that if we have a tall transplant and actually maybe bury it horizontally in the ground and that will root down. If you don't put your tomatoes in cages, they will naturally root down as the stems are hitting the soil. So it's, it's not uh, something unusual to see tomatoes do that. The caveat is sometimes people take this way too far. So, you know, I have seen online where people will talk about using a post hole digger to plant tomatoes. That's ridiculous. If you look at the amount of oxygen that is below 12 inches in the soil, there's not much there. Plants have, those are plant roots have to have oxygen. We don't need to try to uh, plant ridiculously deep. We're not benefiting the plant by doing that. It may survive and it may survive because of those areas that are upper in the top that are able to produce roots. Uh, but quite frankly, you know, six to eight inches deep is more than enough on a tomato. If you go deeper than that, I think there's little utility to it. Um, and again, I'd rather honestly have a small transplant rather than a three foot one that I'm trying to bury in the ground. Uh, a small plant's gonna establish and grow quickly. So a couple of things real quick. This is the QR code for the resource document for our vegetable gardening resources. Uh, not only the things I've covered tonight, but the things that I have done on other nights as well. You can see the URL there, uh, tiny.utk.edu slash veg garden. And the one below that is actually the survey link. So I'm still going to send that in the email. But while you are on your smart device, if you want to go ahead and go on that link and complete the survey for tonight's class, that would be perfectly fine. Um, so I'll leave that up there for just a moment for anyone. And with that, we are actually done.